Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Actually, I'm really, really glad you're here. I kind of have this problem. I've really been thinking about it a whole lot, and I don't really want everybody to know, but I kind of want to talk to somebody. Can I talk to you about it? Can it just be between you and me? I'm... I hope nobody else hears. So... Have you ever had your mom or dad or your grandma or your granddaddy or your brother or sister tell you, don't do this, and then have somebody else try to get you to do it? Has that ever happened to you? What'd you do? Did you do it? Did you get in trouble? Or did you not do it? Did you listen to your mom and dad or, or whoever told you not to do it? So. I used to live at this place. It was an island. It was a really, really cool island. You could go to the beach. You could go to the ice cream place. You could walk everywhere. Actually, I did walk everywhere. I even had to walk to school. So all the kids walked everywhere. We um, we didn't. I wouldn't do this nowadays with my kids, but uh, we didn't have to go with our parents. We were supposed to walk to school. We would walk to the park. We would walk to get ice cream. We'd walk to the beach. We'd walk to the pier. I was all the time walking with my friends. And I had a couple friends, one in particular, they liked to go to the gas station. Now at this place, they called a gas station a Jiffy store. And they would go there and they would steal. And they would steal candy or chips or drinks or whatever, whatever they wanted to steal. And it's not because they were hungry. Actually, I know they had money, but their mom always left them money just sitting on the table for them to have to just take so that they always could buy supper or whatever. Um, oftentimes they just went and bought something for supper themselves and they would want me to steal and that was a big no-no I wasn't allowed to steal my parents would you know I would have gotten so much trouble if I had stole so I wouldn't steal but it's kind of hard when your friends are telling you to do something you're not supposed to and they can even get mean about it they can start picking on you or making you feel like they're not going to be your friend anymore or you're so lame and you're not cool if you don't go do this and um that can be really really hard for a little kid not even just for a little kid for a grown-up that can be really hard to feel like you're not going to have friends and you're not going to fit in and everybody's going to make fun of you and treat you bad if you don't do this thing that you know you shouldn't do but everybody's saying hey go do it and uh still i wouldn't steal but afterwards, I would eat it. Whatever she stole, I would eat some of it with them. I would kind of feel bad, but I still kind of would do it. And, um, do you think that was bad? Do you think that was wrong of me? Um, it might have been, but I didn't steal. And that's what my parents told me don't steal. So, I didn't steal. So, was that really bad? I'm not sure. What do you think? Well, I have a friend today, they're going to tell us a story about the very first time somebody told somebody else to do something they weren't supposed to do. Well, let's go see what happened in that story and maybe that can help us figure out if what I did was wrong and what I should do about it. So let's go jump into some prayer and sing some songs to Yahweh and then we'll get to that story. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've made and for Shabbat and we pray that you bless this day and bless our time as we uh, learn together your word and we pray that you would help us to put into practice the things that you teach us to honor and please you in all that we say and do. We love you and thank you and pray this in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, kids. Shabbat Shalom. Last week we talked about how Yah made everything beautiful and everything good. And today we're going to find out what happened. And um, we're going to talk, the song that we have today for you talks about how it started out with no sin in the garden. And that we're going to end with no sin in the kingdom yes. because of Messiah Yeshua and what he did for us. So we hope that you will listen to this song and get the chorus where it teaches what sin is. And practice it in your life, or rather, don't practice sin in your life. Right. <laughs> so here we go. Okay. No sin, no sin in the garden. That's where we begin in Eden. Yeah, 
told Adam what he should do, and he told Eve so she knew too. Sin is when we don't listen to Yah's loving instruction. Sin is when we disobey all the good things Yah did say. Then a serpent came to tell Eve to eat and be like hell. Adam knew it wasn't right, but still he chose to take a bite. Sin is when we don't listen to Yah's loving instruction. Sin is when we Messiah came Eve's promised seed, the Father's plan to fix her deed. The serpent would bruise his heel, but the serpent his heel would kill. Sin is when we don't listen to Yah's loving instruction. No sin, no sin in the kingdom, that's how we end as we begun. With no sin, no sin in the kingdom, when all is said and all is done. Sin is when we don't listen to God's loving instruction. Sin is when we Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Like, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Miss Bailey. I'm Miss Kaylee's BFF. We've, like, known each other, like, all of our lives. And, like, she can totally finish my sentences. We're, like, so close. We're, like, we're like this. Like, so close. So, Miss Kaylee was telling me that she, like, so had this problem. And, like, she didn't really want to share me that problem, even though we're so close. Like, I don't understand. But she just told me a little bit, like, there was this friend and they had this thing going on where like somebody wanted to get them to do something they weren't supposed to do but she wouldn't tell me who it was or, or what it was but I told her I so knew this awesome story that was like the very 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 first time anybody ever told somebody to do something they weren't supposed to do and so I said I could share it and like maybe that would totally help her figure out her problem and like she wanted me to share it with y'all too so I said well awesome I can do that so I'm gonna share the story so you know the term OMG? Like, I totally don't like that. I don't like that term. Like, I just don't like G. Like, nothing against G. I just don't, I just don't like G. Like, I don't know. But I like tea. Do you like tea? Like, do you like hot tea and cold tea and herbal tea? Like, tea is awesome. Like, sweet tea. Oh, sweet tea is it. OMT. That's what I'm gonna say. So, OMT, this is gonna be a great story. So y'all Yellowheem formed man out of the dust of the ground. Like, he took the dust, you know, the dirt, and he formed him. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became like a living being. Some scriptures say a living soul. So did you catch that? What makes a living soul? It's the body that was formed and the breath of life. And that guy was like totally the first dude ever. His name was Adam. Like, we don't know of anybody before that. Like, it's totally Adam. He's the first dude. So Yahweh planted a garden in Eden to the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, he like totally made every tree that was pleasant to the eyes and like totally good for food. And he made the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, that sounds like serious business. A tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whoa. So there was a river that went from Eden and it watered the garden for him. I mean, that's like, how perfect y'all is like amazing because that's a lot of work to go water your garden. So that was a perfect idea. 
and it split off into four river heads. And one of the river heads was the river Pishon. And it surrounded this land that was like awesome. Like if you wanted to be decked out, that's where you needed to be. It had gold and it wasn't just gold, it was good gold. And they had the Shoham stone and they had this other thing called like Bedellum. And like if you wanted some jewelry, that's the place to be. But it surrounded the land Hawala. So the second river was Gihon and it surrounded the land of Cush. The third river was Hittikil and it went to the east to Ashur. And the fourth river was the Euphrates. You might have heard that river before. I mean, that's like a popular river, the Euphrates. So Yahweh put the man he had formed into that garden and he put him there with a job. Like he was supposed to work it and to guard it. He wasn't just supposed to lay around all day eating fruit, but I'm sure he like totally did that. I bet it was like the best fruit smoothies ever. And Yahweh Elohim commanded him to eat of every tree that was in there, except for the one that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, that like, that sounds kind of scary. And he said, the day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. And so I just want to say something right now. Like sometimes when we look at Hebrew, they didn't have punctuation when they would write it. So sometimes, sometimes things just doesn't sound quite the way it's meant sometimes. Like you could so say, let's play dog. Or you could say, let's play dog. And so it's hard when we're reading and there's no punctuation to know which one it is. So sometimes, like if you said, in the day that you eat it, you shall certainly die. Maybe sometimes it means like you eat it, you're going to drop over and die right then. But sometimes maybe it means that you're not going to die that day, but because you ate it that day, now you get the punishment that you're going to die. So just know sometimes when we don't have punctuation, it'll sound like, let's play dog or let's play dog. You know, it can kind of be... Sometimes we gotta think about and hear the rest of the story and see how it turns out to know exactly are you gonna eat it and like fall over and die right then or that day you ate it and so you're gonna end up dying later. So let's just see what happens. So Yahweh said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm like totally gonna make him a helper to be his counterpart. I mean, that's a weird word, counterpart, right? So what does counterpart mean? Like, so a counterweight, have you ever heard of counterweight? That might be a weird word too. So maybe... Have you ever seen the game, a seesaw? You know, it's that little thing that goes up and down and up and down. And, you know, it's there and somebody sits on it and it's like this. And they're just on the ground, right? It's like no fun just there by yourself. So you like totally need somebody else to come and play the game. And if you come and put somebody who's really big and heavy, bloop, that person just flies straight up in the air. And it's like, that's not even fun because now you're just stuck in the air like before you're like totally stuck on the ground. And if you put somebody who weighs just a little bit, you know, that first person's there, they'll just kind of move it a little bit. It's still not fun. Like to have it fun, you need to have somebody who's the counterweight, the, ex the same similar weight, so it balances. And so that's what, so on the seesaw, you want somebody that you can bounce up and down with and you don't get stuck. So you need a counterweight. So that's kind of like the counterpart. You always thought, oh, it's not good for him to be alone. He totally needs somebody to help balance him out and help in life so that it's all good. So Yahweh made all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air and like everything. He made them from the dust. And he brought them to Adam and there was still not a helper to be found. There was no one there to be his counterpart. And so Yahweh said, okay, I'm going to cause you to have a deep sleep. And he went and actually took Adam's rib out of his body and he closed up the flesh in his place and he used that rib to make his helper. This helper he brought to him and he called her woman because she came totally from man. Like everybody else like totally came from dust, but the woman was special. Like. She didn't just come from dust. I mean, like his rib originally was dust, but she was taken from the man, like totally different than every other creation. That was like totally different. So she was a little special, but you know, like Adam totally got to name everybody. That was like so cool. Like it actually says that Yahweh brought him the animals that he made and whatever Adam named him, that was their name. I mean, like, that's awesome. Can you just imagine Yahweh bringing him the animals? I mean, that's pretty cool. So he brought him the woman and Adam named her woman. So when he brought the woman like to this guy, he like was so excited because it was like a seesaw. It was his counterpart. It was like the perfect person to play life with. So, I mean, it was just like perfect. So then Yahweh says, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother and like totally cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. I mean, like, what does cleave mean? I mean, that's just like weird. Like, I didn't really know what that meant. And so I looked it up and like, when you look something up, you totally get the full idea and you just like, it's like, wow, you know what it means. So cleave is like so cool. So it's actually like to pursue and to like overtake and to be like fastened together, to like be stuck together. 
and like glued together. It's like to follow closely and like stay, stay as one. So it's not just like literally she was like his rib and so now they're like he's whole again. It goes even beyond that. Like they're supposed to like stay together and be like they're glued together. And that's like so much deeper than just body. It's even like mind and emotions and how they live and what's important and what you should do. Like they should totally be together. So then it says that they were both naked and they were like not ashamed. I mean, that's just like, that's just weird. But you know, they didn't know that they were naked and so they didn't have a problem. So think about babies, like babies, they can totally just lay there and they don't know they're naked and like they just totally don't care that they're naked. Like anybody can change their diaper and they just like, okay, la di da. And like, they just totally don't care. And so that's kind of like how Adam and Eve were. They like totally didn't know they were naked. So then like they're totally in the garden and there was like the serpent. And it says that the serpent was like more crafty than any other beast of the field. And like that totally doesn't mean that he was like knitting and painting and like crafty like arts and crafts but like he was sneaky and he was tricky and actually that word serpent in hebrew it means deceiver so he was like totally really good at deceiving and so he came to eve one day and he like didn't just tell her he'd do something you shouldn't do he like questioned her and questions sometimes can make people start thinking stuff they didn't think before so we got to like really question the questions. So the first thing he said was, is it true that Elohim said, do not eat of every tree in the garden? I mean, that was like totally not what Yahweh said, but he's trying to make it like question. Like what did Yahweh really say? Like, do you know? Then Eve was like, totally, we can eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden. It's just the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That one we can't eat. Yahweh said, do not eat it and do not touch it lest you die. Now, some people are like, well, they didn't say don't touch it to begin with. So we don't know if like that's what Adam told Eve or if maybe he always said that later or if maybe that's just what Eve was thinking, like if you even touch it. But maybe he always said that because she said, Yahweh always said, do not eat it and do not even touch it lest you die. But either way, like if there's something really bad, we don't want to be around it, right? So then the serpent keeps on with like saying stuff to make her question Elohim. That's what he's doing. He's making her question whether like Elohim, you can believe him or whether he's like true. And uh, like, have you ever heard anything? Like today, I know people will make you try to question like, is Elohim true? Can you like really believe him? And that's totally what Satan still does today as he tries to make you question that first. Because if you question that, you'll do all the things you're not supposed to do. So then after Satan questioned, like is what Elohim said true? Then he came in and he was totally like, oh, that's not right. You certainly won't die. Elohim just doesn't want you to eat it because the day that you do, he knows your eyes will be open and you'll be like Elohim and you'll know good and evil. And so that's the reason why. So like Satan's really good at that. He like comes and makes you like think, why, you know, is that true? Like really, is Elohim true? Can you believe him? And then he makes you reason like, oh no. See, we can really do things we're not supposed to do because we're not doing it for that reason. So it's okay. So he's really good at that. So then Eve saw the tree and she saw one, it was good for food. Like that's what Yahweh said in the beginning, you know, he made the trees that were good for food. And it was pleasant to look at. That's totally what Elohim said, right? So it's like, it's matching up with the other ones that he made. But then she saw it was desirable to make one wise. So she like totally added in this new thing that makes it better, right? It's even better than what Elohim said because now it's gonna make one wise. Now, we don't know if she saw this tree like right when Satan was talking to her, the serpent was talking to her, or if it was like another day or later that day. It might have been right then, but it might have been later. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. And then she like totally took of the fruit and she ate it like OMT. She ate it. And then she gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. <gasps> this is like, ooh, this, this, is, this is bad. This was that tree that was the knowledge of good and evil. This, this is bad. So this all just started with like all Satan had to do, all the serpent had to do was question, can you believe Elohim? As, can you really like really believe him? And that's all it took for him to just add in this little, oh, that's not why. This is why you won't, nothing bad will really happen. Because all he had to do was make her question, do you believe Elohim? That's all. So then their eyes were open and they knew they were naked. And so obviously now that you know you're naked, just like, when you're not a baby anymore and you like totally know you're naked, you get embarrassed. So they went and got fig leaves and they like sewed them together and made coverings to cover their bodies. So then they heard Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden and they were like, 
uh oh and it was like the cool of the day that's like the perfect time for you to go walk in the garden when it's not hot and so like Yahweh was like totally walking in the garden which is like so cool to like think about Yahweh walking in the garden and you could even like hear him walking I mean that's just like really cool but because they had done something wrong they like went and hid themselves in the trees have you ever done something you weren't supposed to do and then like you heard your parents walk into the room or walking down the hall and like got scared that's like what they did totally did and Yahweh Elohim called and he's like where are you and Adam answered and said I heard your voice in the garden and I hid myself because I was naked and I was afraid because I was naked so Yahweh was like who made you know you were naked did you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the one that I told you do not eat and Adam was totally like the woman whom you gave to me she gave to me and I ate then Yahweh Elohim said to the woman what is this that you've done and the woman said the serpent deceived me and I ate and to the serpent he said because you have done this you are like totally more cursed than like every other beast of the field on your belly you shall go and eat dust like all the days of your life like that would be disgusting I put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed he shall crush your head and you shall crush his heel I mean that's like I don't know some of this is really deep like I think some of this stuff isn't just like just about like that day. I think some of this stuff is probably like talking about something in the future. And then to the woman, he said, I greatly increase your sorrow and your conception. Bring forth children in pain. I mean, I don't think any of y'all have had babies except for the grownups, but it can really, really hurt to give birth. Like totally. And your desire is for your husband and he does rule over you. And to the man, he said, because you listened to the voice of your wife and ate of the tree that I told you, do not eat. Cursed is the ground, and in toil you are to eat of it all the days of your life. The ground is to bring forth thorns and thistles. I mean, like, ouch. That's like, ugh. Have you ever had thorns? They, like, really hurt. And thistles, they're so prickly. Oh, and you, like, can't get rid of them. They're, like, such a pain to try to get out of your garden. I don't know if you'll have a garden, but, oh, it's a pain. I don't, I don't like thorns and thistles. But the ground's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. And you're, like, totally supposed to eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you're to eat bread all the days of your life. Like... You know, to go out and like grow your bread or grow your grain to make your bread. I mean, it's hot and you got to get all them weeds out, all them thorns and thistles. It's hard work. And even if you're not out there like actually growing your grain, you totally have to go work really, really, really hard to like be able to buy the food that you eat. It's like really hard work all day long working to get food. Where before, Yahweh planted the garden and it was just there. I mean, like how cool was that? So he said, by the sweat of your face, you're to eat bread until you return to the dust. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust and dust you will return. And Yahweh Elohim made coats of skin for covering for him and his wife, and he dressed them. I mean, they, think about that, Yahweh dressed them. Like, just like a baby, they had like not ever put on clothes before. And so, just like a mommy and a daddy like dresses the baby for the first time. Like, just think about that, like Yahweh actually dressed them. And like Yahweh Elohim like so said, the man has become like one of us. Now I'm gonna stop for a minute and like tell you a little bit. So the word Elohim, in Hebrew, when you have that him at the end, that means it's plural. That means it's more than one. And so, like, if it was just one mighty one, it would be El. And since it's Elohim, that means there's, like, somebody else there. And so Yahweh Elohim said, See? See, the man has become like us. I wonder who that us is. Maybe you can talk to your parents about that and see what y'all think about it. So he's become like us to know good and evil. So whoever that other us is, they know good and evil, too. Now, lest he put out his hand and take of the tree, the fruit from the tree of life and live forever. So Yahweh Elohim sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So like, that's really cool. So I don't know if you noticed, but like Yahweh totally formed Adam from the dust of the ground. And then after he planted Eden and had this garden, then he put Adam in that garden. So like he wasn't made from the dust in Eden. And then it says Yahweh sent him away to till the ground from which he had come, which he had been made from. So I thought that was kind of cool. I had not noticed that before reading the story this time. So that was like really cool that kind of like he's going back to wherever he was made from. That's kind of cool. So he drove the man out and he placed Kerubim at the east of the garden and a flaming sword that like totally turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So like that's another one that Kerubim. So like normally if you like look at a kid's book, they'll have like a messenger there with a sword. But Kerubim, that's plural. Kerub or cherub as some things will say that would be one so if it's carabim, i'm thinking that maybe yahweh like totally put multiple messengers around 
And it says, so you put them, and then it says, and a flaming sword that turned every way. I don't know, like maybe they had a sword that turned every way. But I don't know, that kind of sounds strange. Like he put them and a flaming sword. So I don't know, maybe there's like a sword there by itself that was like turning. I don't know. That's like, talk to your parents about that. Cause that's like, I don't know. That's just weird. But maybe just the messengers had their swords and they were there to like guard the way to the tree so that nobody could go and take of it and live forever after they had done what they were not supposed to do. So I don't know if the story like helped you or helped Miss Kaylee, but I hope it did. It was super interesting anyway. It's like, OMT, this is like, whoa, this is a big deal story. So Shabbat Shalom. I hope that was interesting. I hope it helps you out with trying to make sure you don't question whether Yahweh is believable and you believe him and believe what he says and like totally do it because it's not good if you don't. Shalom friends, this is Miss Ashley and I will be doing your nature lesson. We're going to start talking about apples because often with the story of Adam and Eve, apples are talked about. So let's start with some facts. Apples are a member of the rose family of plants along with pears, peaches, plums, and cherries. The science of apple growing is called pomology. Apples come in all shades of red, green, and yellow. Most apples are still picked by hand. It takes about 36 apples to create one gallon of apple cider. And a standard apple tree starts bearing fruit eight to 10 years after it's planted. A dwarf tree starts bearing in three to five years. It takes the energy from 50 leaves to produce one apple. And a bushel of apples weighs 42 pounds and will yield 20 to 24 quarts of applesauce. That's a lot of applesauce. Most apples blossoms are pink when they open, but gradually transition to white. A large sized apple has about 130 calories, meaning Yah made them to be good for us. And they contain five grams of fiber, including the soluble fiber pectin. Apples are fat free, sodium free, and cholesterol free, and they taste great too. What are your favorite ways to have, have apples? Do you know that apples are part of the way that Yah made us to be able to stay healthy and happy and be protected from bad things that could make us ill? Now we're also going to talk about fig leaves because fig leaves are what Adam and Eve decided to put on when they ate and realized they needed some clothes. Fig leaves are best suited for cooked applications such as steaming, baking, and grilling. They are commonly used as a wrap and are steamed with meats, veggies, seafood to impart a smoky, fruity flavor and a distinct coconut aroma. Mmm, that sounds yummy. In addition, fig leaves can be used to make a syrup for glazing meats or to create jelly. Have you heard of figs? Have you eaten a fig? Some people believe that the fig was actually the fruit that Adam and Eve picked since they used fig leaves afterwards. Let's also now talk about snakes since a snake is what Satan disguised himself as to deceive Adam and Eve. Snakes have a very big family. According to the latest count, there are 3,789 snake species. They are solar powered and rely fully on external heat or light sources, meaning Yah made them to be able to need the sun to stay warm. We can internally regulate warmth, but snakes need the sun to keep warm. Not all snakes lay eggs. You might have learned that reptiles are different from mammals because they lay eggs. And while we like to classify and categorize everything around us, Yah has made things with different rules. While approximately 70% of snakes lay eggs, others don't. Snakes living in especially colder climates have live births because the eggs wouldn't survive outside. Did you know snakes do not have eyelids? Ever wonder why snakes might give you an eerie feeling? They don't have eyelids. That means they don't blink and they have to sleep with their eyes wide open. Instead of eyelids, they have a small, thin membrane attached to each eye to protect them. The membrane is called a brill. In German, it means glasses. Did you know snakes smell with their tongues? 
They have nostrils, but they don't use them to smell. Instead, they have a sense of smell with their tongue and by using their Jacobson's organ in the roof of their mouth. Their smell is quite excellent and has also been described as smelling in stereo. They have a forked tongue and multiple receptors able to pick up different amounts of chemical cues. Their table manners are different than ours. When snakes are eating, they can't help but to swallow their food whole because they cannot chew. Instead, snakes have very flexible lower jaws, which allow them to eat animals who are 75% to 100% larger than their own head. The chemicals in their digestive tract will do all the work and break down the food once ingested. Well, that's all we have for our nature lesson today. Shalom and have a wonderful Shabbat. So what do you think about that story? Do you think I did something wrong? Like Adam didn't take the fruit. Like he didn't go and get it. He did eat it though. And he knew he wasn't supposed to. And I didn't steal the candy, but I did eat it. And I know it was stolen candy. And I know my you know, I shouldn't be stealing things. And though I didn't steal it, I'm still taking of the stolen things that I know were stolen. So I'm thinking I did something wrong. And I think I need to take responsibility for what I did. I don't know if you noticed, but when Yahweh came and asked Adam, you know, did you take, take this fruit that I told you not to take? Adam didn't say, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. And please forgive me. That's not what he did. He said, it's her fault, her fault. This lady that you gave me, she made me take of it. And then he always said to Eve, you know, asked her about it. And then she said, the serpent, not I did it, this serpent did it. Yeah, and then, then she ate, yeah, she, she did, but she didn't go, yes, I did it. And I'm sorry, please forgive me. And sometimes, we can say, I'm sorry, and that's it. Now we do need to change what we did and, and really repent. Repent isn't just saying, I'm sorry. Repent is changing your ways. It's not doing that thing again. It's saying, I'm sorry, taking responsibility, and then not doing it anymore. So we have to go all the way through if we're going to repent. But sometimes we can repent and the problem gets all better and it goes away. Sometimes the problem is a way that we still have to get in trouble we still have to fix what we broke, buy it again, um, help somebody, you know, feel better because we, we physically hurt them or hurt their feelings or we ruined their thing. Sometimes there's still a problem. And even that we can't fix, sometimes we do bad things and there's no way to fix it, but we still need to realize we did something wrong and take responsibility for it. And even though that may not fix the problem, sometimes it may make, make it better and make it where the other person isn't upset anymore, even though they might still have lost something or still have hurt feelings, but they can say, okay, I'll forgive you. And, and we can be friends and, and go on. And it just makes me wonder, which they still, that was the rule. If you eat this fruit, you're going to die. So that, that is the punishment that they were going to get for it. But it just makes me wonder what would have happened if they had said, I'm sorry. I did this and took responsibility for it. It may not have changed anything. It may not have. Sometimes that doesn't fix it. But a lot of times it does. What do you think about that? Adam and Eve did something. And then everybody from then on suffers for it. Does that seem fair? Does it seem fair for your mom and dad to have done something when they were little kids? And then you get punished for it now? Does that seem fair? Well, it kind of doesn't seem fair, but sometimes that's the way things happen. Sometimes people do something and it causes permanent damage that then affects somebody else and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Sometimes we say mean things to our brothers and sisters. We say, "Ooh, that dress looks horrible on you. Ugh, you look goofy with them glasses. Ugh, your hair is so ugly like that. <laughs> that was a goofy story. I wouldn't tell anybody that story. And those are things that 
sometimes we don't really mean, maybe we mean it a little bit, and we say these mean things. But sometimes those mean things, they really, no, not sometimes, most of the time, those mean things go inside their hearts and inside their minds. And for the rest of their life, every time they write a story, that little voice is in the back of their head that says, that's not a good story. Every time they go and buy a new dress, they hear, you look ugly in dresses, and they don't even want to get it. And that can affect them the rest of their life. Even when they're a grown up, you think grown ups don't have problems, but they do. Even grown ups have a hard time with uh, having people say, hey, you should do this, and you know you shouldn't do it, and you do it, or at least have a hard time saying no. Grown ups do that too. It's not just a problem for kids. And grown ups, they still have hurt feelings. I don't know if you know any grown ups with hurt feelings, but I do. And they get new hurt feelings. But they definitely keep ones from long ago, from when they were little kids, and their brothers and sisters or friends said things that hurt them. Sometimes that affects how they go on and deal with their kids, and that can actually cause hurts and their kids, and then their kids, because of something that we said one time that we thought was silly or goofy, but it was really mean. So we need to think about how the sins that we might do they might go on to hurt people for a long time. It's not just this moment. It's not just a, oh, I'm going to take this. Oh, I'm going to do that. Oh, I'm going to say this. They really do affect people for a long time. Just like Adam and Eve's sin affect everybody from then on in a lot of ways. Everybody could have had eternal life right then and there. Everybody could have lived in this awesome garden, that amazing food that just grew all the time, tastes so good. Nobody was like, slave into all these bugs that devour their garden and the drought that wouldn't let their plants grow and just crummy dirt that doesn't let their plants grow. Nobody would have been starving. Everybody would have been yummy, good, healthy stuff that was full of nutrition and lived happy, healthy lives ever after. But it affected everybody. And now all of our daddies, they have to work really, really hard by the sweat of their brow to put food on the table, whether that's them actually out working in the field or that's them working long hours at a desk to provide money to put food on the table. And mommies give birth and it hurts. And that's from somebody else's sin. And sometimes our sins get the hurts. The hurts pass on to other people. So we need to remember that. So I know that's kind of sad, but I know I'm going to start trying to take more responsibility when I do something I'm not supposed to. What about you? Well, let's go jump in and uh, learn some more with some Hebrew and see what else our friends have for us. Shalom, Mishpacha. This is your Chavara Yohana, or Miss Joanna, here with Bryn to present this week's Hebrew language lesson. Today we will learn how to say the names of the body parts in Hebrew. This after hearing about the creation of Ben Adam, or human beings, or literally children of Adam, from Genesis chapter 2. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. The Hebrew name of this book of Torah is Bereshit, which means beginning. The very first words in the book of Bereshit are, In the beginning Yahweh created. Today we learned about Yahweh's creation of the first Ish, man, and the first Isha, woman. 
who were said to be created Betzalem Elohim, that is, in the image of Elohim. Scripture tells us that Yahweh created the Ish, man, from the dirt of the ground, and he named the Ish, man, Adam, or Adam. The word Adam comes from the same Hebrew root word that both red and dirt come from. Some people explain that the dirt Yahweh created Adam from must have been red clay, and that's why Yahweh gave him the name Adam, or Adam. From today's Bible story, we learn that Adam, or Adam, could not find the right partner for himself from among the animals in the garden. So Yahweh caused Adam, or Adam, to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, Yahweh took one of Adam's ribs and created the first Isha, woman, so Adam would not be alone. Adam called the woman Chava, or Eve, which means life or life giver because she was called the mother of all the living. Yahweh called the Isha, woman, an Azir Konegdo, which is a difficult phrase to translate into English, but could be said to mean something like, a very close and very strong friend who works well with the Ish, man, when he is working righteousness. Yahweh then set Adam, Adam, and Chava, Eve, to work together in the garden. Part of Adam's job had been to name all of the animals. Today, our task is to name the body parts of Ben Adam, or human beings, in Hebrew. So let's start at the head, and we'll go to the toes. I'll say each word, and then I'll repeat it, and then you try and say it. Okay? Let's begin. The Hebrew word for body is goof. Goof. The Hebrew word for skin is or. Or. The Hebrew word for head is rosh. Rosh. The Hebrew word for face is panim. Panim. On top of the head, most people have hair. The Hebrew word for hair is seor, seor. In Hebrew, the word for eye is ayin, ayin. The word for ear in Hebrew is ozen, ozen. Okay, I don't know about you, but I could take a bit of a break. So wherever you are, from head to toe and hands and feet, Let's just shake it all out. Shake your whole body. Shake, shake, shake. Shake everything out. Get out some energy. Just shake, shake, shake. Ah, all right. Doesn't that feel better? Now let's get back to work. The Hebrew word for nose is off. Off. The Hebrew word for mouth is pay, pay. In Hebrew, the word for lips is svatayim, svatayim. The Hebrew word for tooth is shen, shen. In Hebrew, the word tongue is lashon, lashon. The Hebrew word for chin is santer, santer. And on the chin, we grow a zakan, or beard, zakan. In Hebrew, the word for arm is zroa, zroa. The Hebrew word for hand is yad, yad. The Hebrew word for hands is yadaim, yadaim. In Hebrew, the word finger is etzba, etzba. The Hebrew word for fingers is etzbaot, etzbaot. The Hebrew word for shin is shok, 
shok. The Hebrew word for foot is regel, regel. The word for feet in Hebrew is reglaim, reglaim. In Hebrew, the word back is pronounced gav, gav. The Hebrew word for belly or tummy or stomach is beten, beten. Ben Adam, or human beings, have lots of body parts, and we only talked about a few. But those myriad body parts all come together to make up individual people. People who are made Betzalem Elohim, in the image of Elohim. In Tehillim, that's Songs of Praise, which we call the Book of Psalms in English, King David, or King David, says, I give thanks to you, for I am fearfully, that means awesomely, and wonderfully made. Wondrous are your works. My soul knows it well. With David's words in mind, I want you to remember, as you practice saying the names of the body parts in Hebrew throughout the week, that you are awesomely and wonderfully made. Betzalem Elohim, in the image of Elohim. Mazel tov, which means congratulations. You have just learned many more new Hebrew words. The more you say them, the quicker you will remember them, and the better you'll become at using them. So practice saying these Hebrew words throughout the week. Until next time, my Chavarim. Shalom b'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Peace to you in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Hello boys and girls and welcome back to Storytime. This is Susie and I'm so glad to be back with you. Wow, that seems like a really sad story. How disobedience can cause some really bad consequences. The word consequences simply means the result of an action. So if you're in a pool or a lake or even your bathtub and you hit the water hard, you're going to create a splash. That's the consequence of hitting the water. In like manner, disobedience and obedience all have consequences. And sadly, when Adam and Eve decided to go against the word of Yah, there were consequences, bad consequences. But did you know our disobedient actions can be redeemed? Be turned around into something good despite us being naughty or refusing to obey? What good came from Adam and Eve's sin? Well, Yah promised to send someone magnificent right from the time sin entered Adam and Eve's heart. This person made a way for us so we can be redeemed, be made new and resurrected to new bodies, to a kingdom that lasts forever. It goes on and on and on. There's no pain, no crying, no bad grumpy feelings. All this because of disobedience. That is an example of grace. Now, I'm not saying we should willfully disobey because as we know, Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden and rightfully so. I'm sure they felt the consequences of their disobedience daily. Adam was once a great gardener. Now he struggled with weeds and the hard ground. Eve had excruciating pain when she had babies. I'm sure they missed Eden a lot. So, on to our story about a boy who lived in France many, many years ago. Have you heard of the term before called Braille? If you look carefully at your local library, you might be able to find a section for Braille books. Braille is a way for blind people to read. We read with our eyes, but when you're blind, your eyes aren't quite working as they should. Thus, reading a standard book is practically impossible. A blind person may see a little bit of light or complete darkness, 
in one or both eyes. For this reason, Braille came to be a raised dotted alphabet that can be read by touch alone. The boy who invented such an incredible tool became blind through his disobedience. Legend says that he was not supposed to be playing with his father's work tools. His father told him not to, and yet he disobeyed. Sadly, through this act of disobedience, the boy lost his eyesight at the young age of three. However, through this, the boy went on to create the writing system called Braille as we know it today. This boy was Louis Braille. Louis Braille was born on January 4, 1809 in Copra a small hillside village near Paris, France. Louis's father was Simon René Braille, a saddle maker. His mother was Monique Baron Braille. Louis was the youngest of their four children. The Braille's lived in a three-room stone house. The food they ate came mostly from their small farm and vineyard. Across the yard, Simon René had his shop with a large workbench, many pieces of leather, mallets, sharp knives and pointed awls. While his father worked, Louis often played nearby with small leftover scraps of leather. One summer day, while his father was outside with a customer, three-year-old Louis went into the shop. He took one of the sharp pointed tools he had seen his father use. Louis played with it, imitating what he had seen his father do so often, but the tool slipped and cut into his eye. Louis screamed. His parents ran to him. They cleaned away the blood and bandaged the eye. The Brawls took Louis to an old woman who lived in the village. She put lily water on the wound. The Brawls took Louis to a doctor, but there was nothing anyone could do to save the eye. It became infected. The infection spread to the other eye and within a short while Louis Brawl was blind. Louis had to learn again how to feed himself and how to walk without bumping into things. Louis's father made him a cane. Louis used it to tap the ground in front of him to make sure the path was clear. And when Louis walked somewhere, he counted his steps. He remembered how many there were for his way back. In his now completely dark world, Louis became more aware of sounds, smells and the shapes and feel of things. He learned to distinguish the different sounds people made when they walked. He often knew who was coming to the house by the sound their cart made when the wheels rolled over the cobblestone path. In the early 1800s, France was at war. The French Emperor Napoleon had sent huge armies to fight across Europe and in Russia. At first they were victorious, but by 1814 the French armies had been defeated and were hurrying back home. In April 1814, enemy Russian soldiers invaded Kupra and demanded to be housed and fed. For the next two years, many Russian soldiers passed through the Braal's house. It must have been frightening for young Louis to live with strangers he could neither see nor understand. In 1815, a new priest, Jacques Paulouis, came to Coupra. He became Louis's first teacher. He taught Louis the Bible. He taught him to recognise animals by their sounds and flowers by their feel and smell. Louis's father hammered round-tipped upholstery nails into a board to form letters. Louis felt the heads of the nails and learned the alphabet. His father then taught him how to combine letters and form words. The next year, a new schoolmaster, Antoine Berret, came to Coupra. 
It was unusual then for a blind child to attend school. But Louis was especially smart and Antoine Berret was anxious to teach him. Louis could only learn by listening. He couldn't read books the way other children could. Nonetheless, he had a good memory and was an excellent student. In February 1819, Louis was sent to Paris to live and study at the National Institute for Blind Children. It was the world's first school for the blind, founded in 1784 by Valentin Oui. When Louis came to the school, it was in a bleak five-storey building with metal bars on the windows. Thirty years earlier, during the days of the French Revolution, the building had been a prison. Louis Braal would live at the school for the rest of his life. There were books at the Institute for Louis to read. They had raised letters he could feel. The letters were large. The books were big and heavy. Tracing each letter with his fingertips was a slow process. He had to be sure to distinguish between a P and an R, an E and an F. But at last Louis was reading. There were craft and music classes and regular lessons in history, geography, mathematics, Latin and grammar. Louis especially loved music. He had a real talent for it and learned to play the piano, organ, violin and cello. Beginning in 1834, Louis played the organ in a few Paris churches. In 1821, Louis Brau was taught sonography, night writing, a code of raised dots and dashes. It had been invented by Charles Barbier, a captain in the French army, so soldiers could read messages in the dark without lighting a lamp. The soldiers could feel the messages. Louis Brau was excited by sonography. He could use it to read and write, but he quickly saw problems with the system. It took a great many dots to write a single word. There was no code for numbers or punctuation marks. Sonography was a phonetic system with symbols for every sound, but not every letter. So Louis could not spell with it. Louis began to experiment with his own code. He worked on it late at night after his classmates were asleep. He worked on it early in the morning too, before classes. In 1824, Louis Braille demonstrated his system to Dr. André Pinier, the school principal. Louis Braille's code used raised dots in two rows of three dots each, like the six dots on a domino. He found 63 different combinations, enough for each letter of the alphabet punctuation marks, numbers, and math signs. Later he developed a raised dot system for musical notes. Brahl's new system was much easier to learn and read than sonography. By 1825, Louis Brahl and his friend Gabriel Gautier had made the first Braille writing board. Now Louis, Gabriel, and other blind people could write too. In 1826, Louis Braille was made an assistant and two years later a full teacher at the National Institute. He taught mathematics, geography, grammar and music. While other teachers at the school punished children who did not understand their lessons, Louis Braille was kind and gentle. At first, many sighted people were against switching to Braille's new system. Adopting the new code would be expensive. It would mean new books would have to be produced for the blind. Sighted people had no problems with the old raised letter system. They could read it easily and saw no need for change. The National Institute still used the old raised letter books, but on their own, the students tried Louis's new system. They loved it. Dr. Pinier wanted it adopted at the school. He felt it should become France's official writing code for the blind, but the directors of the National Institute were against it. 
In 1840, when they found out the school was using books printed in Braille, they forced Dr. Pignier to leave the National Institute. Sighted people were not learning Braille's six-dot system. The blind could not write to them. So in 1839, Louis Braille invented a system he called Ruffy Gruffy, forming the shapes of letters using raised dots. Blind people could feel the letters. Sighted people could see them. While Louis Braille worked on his codes, he continued to teach, but in the middle of lessons he often had to stop. He was having coughing fits. By 1835, his cough developed into tuberculosis, a deadly disease in the 1800s. At times, he was too weak to teach. He often went home to Kupfra to breathe the clean country air and to rest. Then, late in 1851, Louis Braille became gravely ill. From his bed, he told his friends, I am convinced my mission on earth is completed. He died on January 6, 1852, just after his 43rd birthday. The accomplishments of Louis Braille were not widely known in 1852, but by the end of the century, his six-dot code, known simply as Braille, was applied to many languages and was in use around the world. Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf, called Louis Braille a genius with courage and a heart of gold. She wrote that Braille made it a pleasure for me to read. The world around me shone afresh with treasures. She wrote that Louis Braille built a large firm stairway for millions of sense crippled human beings to climb from hopeless darkness to the mind eternal. Author's note, today with proper treatment, Louis Braille's eye injury would not result in blindness. Today there are also medicines to successfully treat tuberculosis, the disease that killed Louis Braille. Louis Braille first experimented with dots and dashes. When he noticed it was easier to feel just dots, he dropped the dashes. In 1952, on the 100th anniversary of Louis Braille's death, his remains were moved to the Pathion in Paris. He was laid to rest there among other great French heroes. Well, there you have it, the story of Louis Braille, who despite his disobedience, went on to live a rich life, a life that changed the course of history as we know it, there is a picture of the Braille alphabet in this book, but it might be a little hard to read, so feel free to have one of your parents look it up for you. Well, I had a lot of fun. Thank you for listening. Shalom. Wow, that was a lot of new words in Hebrew. Did you learn anything new? I know I did. That was a lot. Are you going to be using those words? You can talk to your brothers and sisters and try out your new words so that you learn them and you can start using them all the time. That's the way we learn a new language. Just like with a baby, they can't talk. And when they first figure out mama, and then they go, mama, 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 they have to use it. And they figure out, hey, that's what that is. And that's the exact same way that we have to do with a new language to memorize it and learn it and get good at it. We have to use it all the time. So go make sure you use it. So we are now going to jump in into more singing and some more hands-on, and we are going to go make us a snake. Did you know you can make a snake? Let's go see how. Adam and Eve lived in the garden, the garden, the garden. Adam and Eve lived.
Shabbat Shalom, everyone! This week, our memory verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For, as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few words out of this verse, and you're going to fill in the blanks after you pause the video. Let's begin. Here we go. Now pause the video. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Great! Now let's try again. Pause the video and fill in the blanks. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Very good. Now let's try something a little harder. Go ahead and pause the video. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Awesome. Ready for a harder one? Here we go. Pause the video. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15.22 Awesome! You ready to do this by yourself now? Go ahead and pause the video and recite the memory verse without any help. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15.22 Great job! Now that you've memorized this verse, why don't you take a minute and talk to your parents about how you think this verse connects to the scriptures you've learned this week, and how it applies to your life. Until next time, Shabbat Shalom! Hey everybody, welcome to week two, Adam and Eve. I'm Ashley, and today we're going to be doing a craft and making this circuit. So let's get started. These are all the items that you're going to need today. I got all of them at my local Walmart, and you can get them just about anywhere. So first things first, let's make sure we cover our workspace with something. Because today we're going to be working with a little bit of food coloring, and that stuff can get on everything and it can stain everything, so let's just cover our workspace.
All right, everyone. Um, let's take a moment to reflect and to pray over all that we've learned today by the story of Adam and Eve. And um, I'm going to pray out loud. And I would like for you guys to pray in your heart, pray with your spirit, and pray with your mind as I pray out loud for us, okay? All right, here we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you have done for us. We thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you for the convictions that you give to us that keep us from sinning. We thank you for your word and for your instructions. The things that keep us safe, the things that keep us from doing the wrong things that produce bad fruit. We want your spiritual fruit, Father, that yummy, yummy, sweet tasting fruit that you have for us when we choose not to sin. Help us in those moments, Father, when we feel angry and we feel like we want to sin. Help us to show us that you are there and that you can guide us into the the choice to not sin, the righteous choice, the spiritual fruit that we can produce by making those choices together. I pray for each little heart that is watching us right now, that is with us right now and trained up in Torah, and I just ask that you would bless their families, Father. Bless each one of them. Show them your love. Show them that you are there, that you're present with them, Father. Hold them in your arms and close to your heart. I just thank you so much for all that you're doing for them and for us as the parents. And I just ask that um, they would all have a blessed week and um, a very, very relaxing and restful Shabbat. In your son's name, Amen. Thank you. Bye, guys.